Sandy's Ghost, narrated by Torvi Brown. Commendations for the night, stranger? Well, yes, I reckon we can fix a place for you. Have a cheer and set you down. Thank you. Don't you find this rather a lonely place, no neighbors, no nothing, that I can see? How came you to settle here, so far removed from other habitations? Well, perhaps it's best not to ask too many questions to once. Beg your pardon. No offense was intended, I assure you. Simply idle curiosity. Don't say another word, stranger, but come in and we'll have a snack for supper. Polly, bring on the vittles. You're just in time. Polly at once obeyed. She was a typical Western girl, tall, lithe, graceful, and limpid-eyed. She was clear-skinned and high-spirited, too, and in this case ignorant through no fault of her own. John Barr's eyes scanned her intently, and a flush came to her cheeks. For the first time in her life, she was unpleasantly conscious of her bare feet. It may have been this that made her stumble and spill some of the contents of an earthen bowl over the guest's knees as she placed it on the table. Her eyes flashed and a tear of anger twinkled on the lashes. She stopped, half meaning to apologize, but an oath from her father caused her to set the bowl down heavily and to hurry from the cabin. A moment later Barr saw a flutter of pink calico from behind a pile of rocks. Old Kit Robinson saw it too. Don't wonder at you saying taint right. She's a smart girl and a good looker too as should have been sent away from here to school to be educated. But she won't leave her no-count dad. I ought to be shot for cussing her. But I ain't what I used to be. Setting here and keeping guard makes me nervous. Barr's eyes asked the question his lips refused to speak. Supper eaten, the men went outside and sat with their chairs tilted back against the cabin. Something in the younger man's frank face had softened old Kit into a reminiscent mood and made him strangely inclined to gratify an idle curiosity. The soft evening wind sighed through the branches of the tall spruce pines, and the declining rays of the setting sun caused the shadow of the rude home to stretch out longer across the greensward. From its shelter where he sat, John Barr looked out on the grand ranges of the Rockies, and wondered where in their vastness he would find the man he sought, the finding of whom had brought him out into this wild and almost forsaken mining camp. Stranger, I've took a liking to you. You've a something about you that reminds me of someone I know, and you look like an honest chap, say, do you believe in ghosts? He put the question very suddenly, and a look of disappointment crossed his face when Barr told him that he did not believe in spooks. Well, I've seen them. A thought connecting the pink calico with something in the past came to Barr's mind. Can't you tell me about it? he asked. I'd like to if you'll swear, on your derringer, never to blab. Will you swear? The solitary guest started to smile, but the smile faded at the thought of unshed tears in Polly's eyes. It might make it easier for her if he humored the old man. I'll swear, he said. And he did. Do you see one old spruce at the turn of the trail and the cliff just above? Well, that's the spot I'm watching and guarding till the owner comes to claim it. I'm quick to burn powder, and a pretty sure shot. I know a man when I sees him, and I ain't easy fooled. Well, to begin with, I had a partner once, and he was a man, sure enough. He was from the state of New York. I never asked him as to how so fine a gent come to be digging and shoveling in the Rockies, though to myself, I said there was some good reason. He had light hair, and we called him Sandy, for short, and he was just about as gritty as sand. We was as unlike as any two fellers you ever saw. He was quiet-like and steady, 
and I was sorter wild and reckless and liked mounting do most too well. Well, when we had a little dust scrape together, we would divvy, and I took my share way down to the station on the other side of the cliffs and sent it off to the bank in Helena. But I allers left some hid while the girl would find it. Old Sandy had a bank of his own that no one knew about, excepting himself, and every time we divided, he'd carry part of it to his hiding place and then give the rest to me to send to his boy that he said was being educated in some college way up in Boston. He seemed to think a heap of that boy. After a while my old woman give out, and soon we laid her away on the hillside. It was hard, stranger. Old Kit's voice failed him for a moment, but he quickly regained his composure and continued. But when old Sandy, my good old pard, give up I didn't care for nothing. We buried him in style. All the boys from round the digging was there, and many and I was wet. We didn't have nary a preacher, but the girl she prayed at the grave. For the life of me I don't know where she learnt it. Reckon the old woman must have told her. Next morning the girl showed me a letter that Sandy give her just afore he died. It was to his boy, and she was to give it to him if he ever come out this way, and she's got it yet. That same evening after supper, feeling kinder gloomish and like there was something in my throat I couldn't swallow, I took a stroll up the gulch. I went on out to the top of the edge of the big rock and got to studying while I'd find another pard like Sandy. All to once I felt a hand touch my shoulder kinder light once or twice. I jumped up, half expecting it was Sandy, but it was only the girl. Well, I was all took back at first, and then I got mad. What are you doing up here? I asked, kinder rough. She had tears in her eyes as she looked at me and said, Pap, don't get mad. I was lonesome. I seed you coming up this way, and I followed you, cause I wanted to tell you that Sandy said to give his boy his pile when he comes. Well, says I, you might have waited till I come back to the house. And then I sent her back. After she was gone, I sought to studying where in the world Sandy's pile was. I tried to think where could he have hid it. But it weren't no use. All to once I noticed it was plumb dark, and as these mountings ain't a healthy place for a man to roam in after nightfall, especially if he ain't got his shooting irons on. I cut a pretty swift gait for the shack. Just as I come round the bend there at the pine, I happened to look up toward the cliff, and there saw Sandy. Yes, sir. It was him sure as you're born. My feet felt heavy as lead, and I couldn't move from the spot. I tried to holler, but it weren't no go. Finally, I gave a sudden jerk and made a step toward him, and as I did so he disappeared. Then I made tracks for home. But I kept mum, cause I know the boys would say that Mounting Dew was licking up my brains, and I would be seeing snakes and such things afore long. The next night somehow another I thought to go and see if he was there again, and sure enough, there he sought, looking kinder sad and making marks on the rocks with his fingers. I had my hand on my gun this time, so I got a little closer than afore. But, by hooky, he got away from me again, nor did he come back. I could hardly wait fair the next night to come round. At the same time, I was on hand good and early, just as it begun to get dark, and the trees looked like long spooks are stretching out their arms. I looked toward the cliff, and there, he sought marking and scratching on the rock with his fingers and still looking sad. Now, this being the third time, I kinder got bold, and I went a little closter and says, Sandy, well what's the mat matter with you? Didn't the boys do the planting right for you? Then as luck would have it, I thought of something else right quick, and I said, Or is it the dust you have hid where you sitting? Well, he looked up then, and the happiest smile come to his face, and all to once he disappeared again. And since then, I have sought here and guarded the place till the right one comes along to claim it. Let's see. 
What did you say your name was? Pardon me. I thought I had told you. My name is John Willett Barr. Polly, oh Polly. Come here, girl. What was Sandy's full name? I plumb forgot. What you want to know for, she asked. I ain't going to tell you now. That's my own secret. Come, come, girl. Tell me to once, or it won't be healthy for you. Well, then, she answered stubbornly, it's John Willett Barr. At her reply the younger man's face grew deathly pale, and he started up from his chair, but Kit thrust him back into his seat, saying, Bring me the letter, Polly. What are you going to do with it, Pa? she inquired, cautiously. I promised old Sandy on my oath to keep it till the right one comes along to claim it, and I mean to keep my word. The right one is here, girl. There he sits. So trot that letter out, and don't parley long with me if you knows when you well off. Polly stared at the younger man in utter bewilderment for a moment. Then, turning slowly, she stepped quietly into the cabin after the precious document. An unusual gleam of joy lighted up her face, and a suppressed excitement shone in her eyes. Under her breath she said, Somehow or rather I felt he was the right one. Too truly, John Barr realized in that painful moment that he whom he sought was now dead to him, that the father from whom he had been parted so many years was sleeping that long, dreamless sleep in the clay mound on the hillside, which marked his last resting place. As he turned to look at the face of old, honest Kit, who had been his father's friend during those long years of forced exile, a happy smile lit up the old miner's rugged features as he pointed with his finger to the rock cliff near the old spruce vine, and said, in an exultant, trembling voice, There he be, stranger, just as I have seen him many a night, your dad, my pard, poor old Sandy. With an eager voice John Barr sprang forward, and the mountains echoed, and re-echoed the plaintive cry of father, father, but his outstretched arms clasped only emptiness, and the darkening shadows of the rapidly approaching night. The End